Good morning and welcome to our UBC Learning Circle, Empowering Indigenous Subject Matter Experts Through Research with Christopher Horsley. Today's conversation is presented in partnership with the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. We'd like to thank the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle and allowing us to have these conversations. Before we formally begin, I'd like to acknowledge with respect and gratitude that I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box below. Today's learning circle will be exploring empowering Indigenous subject matter experts through research with Christopher Horsey. I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves in just a few moments. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Serene Squawkin. I'm the learning circle manager. I'm Seal Fukunagan on my mother's side and Hickory Apache in Belgium on my father's side. I'll be your moderator for today's discussion and joining us working behind the scenes is Cynthia, our production coordinator and Kira, our production assistant. Um, they'll be in the background uh, interacting with everyone in the chat. And finally, before we get into today's discussion, I'll just provide a gentle heads up that the topics covered may be sensitive or emotionally triggering. Please make sure that you look after yourself. And if at any point you feel like you need to talk to friend, elder, counselor, or family member, don't hesitate to do so. We have some prompts in the chat for you if you need additional support. Now I'll turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, some very important issues. Uh, my name is uh, Christopher Horsethief or Nighthawk in the Kdunaha language. Uh, I just introduced myself in our language that I was happy to be here with everyone. Happy to be here again. This is the second time I've been involved uh, with the UBC Learning Circle. Uh, the first time was, I don't know, 10 years ago or a long, long time ago. Uh, and I'm uh, just happy to be here to uh, share some, some ideas, talk about some things, uh, and, and uh, listen to uh, what you have to say. Uh, so thank you for that uh, territorial acknowledgement. I'm uh, transmitting here today from the Kronaka Nation Governance Building. As you can see, our nation vision statement is behind us. And um, it's always nice when you're on the road and you're outside of your territory to come home and, and be able to do something that helps to bring your community closer to a larger community uh, of uh, academics, students, uh, student leaders, uh, other good people here joining us today. You could have been anywhere in the world today and you chose to be here with me and uh, I really appreciate that, thank you. So are we, are we ready to go? Just gonna jump straight into it. Okay, I'm gonna screen share. Um, I'm gonna present uh, most of this uh, today uh, for what I anticipate to be around 70 minutes. Um, it's a long whirlwind story with a narrative uh, character arc uh, that kind of talks about my community uh, in ways that are emblematic to what I would imagine are most of our communities. I'm gonna talk a little bit about culture, where it comes from. I'm gonna talk about what happens when you disrupt culture. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about resilience, but I'm not gonna talk about it the way that most people think about. Um, I am not here to talk about decolonization. A consistent theme I'm going to present is that we don't need more activists and actors and professional sports personalities. What we need are subject matter experts. 100 years ago, when the big push to civilize indigenous people was really underway, our networks, our language, our cultures, our social systems were changed dramatically. And the most important voices in our community for making decisions and providing stable indigenous cultures were removed from those conversations. Um, I'm not a big believer in volume, emotion, and repetition. Activists could be activists and they can be out there doing their thing, that's great. I would encourage people to uh, engage with education, both from your own cultural and linguistic perspective, and also from a Western perspective, so that you can make better arguments with people that are in charge of funding, that are in a position to change long-term uh, structural uh, inequalities, 
And so that's what I'm going to really focus on here today. I don't mean any disrespect to anyone. If your brother or your cousin is like the number one social media activist out there, that's great. Let them do their thing. Um, you should continue to plug away at school. Uh, think about graduate school. Think about someday getting your doctorate in a field that will allow you to put your community on equal terms with the world around us. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Okay, so I'm going to try and move a few things out of the way. If someone could uh, just give me a thumbs up there, uh, if you can see the title screen. Okay. A um, little bit about myself. Uh, oh, good. I got some animated thumbs up there, so that's really great. A little bit about myself. Uh, that's me, and I'm, I'm older than I look. I was born in 1971. That picture is from about 1977. Uh, 1978, two important things. I'd probably just seen Star Wars <laughs> for the first time in the theater. But also, uh, when I was very young, went to Catholic school. I went to Assumption uh, for three years, living in Bellingham, Washington. That's where I grew up. I did not grow up in my community. That's why I don't sound like most Canadians, and I don't. Um, uh, I tend to uh, not always fit in here in Cranbrook in the far interior of British Columbia. I grew up in the States. I grew up in Bellingham, just south of UBC's uh, main campus there. And I really liked Catholic school. I went to a great Catholic school where I had uh, non uh, sisters or brothers or fathers for teachers. I had regular kind of just um, civilian teachers and I really liked it. The uh, school was very rigorous. I was at least a year ahead of other public school students. And then from there, we moved to Los Angeles where the public schools in Los Angeles were like a year behind Washington. So I was like a super genius when I got down there. Uh, later on, um, I'm, I'm an old school, you can tell by my shirt here. If you were expecting suit and tie Christopher, uh, I wanted to be a little dressed down today, but I'm an old school punk rocker. That's me singing in a band in high school with a couple of friends of mine. They're still in the music industry. I get to hang out with them uh, once in a while. I believed in using my voice from the time I was very young to try and make some changes for the better. Uh, both of my parents always encouraged me to try and use my agency to try and use um, the kind of um, position that I had or my voice or my ability to make change to make things um, better uh, for the greatest amount of people. I'm old school, just a skateboarder, snowboarder, wake surfer. You can see me there doing my thing, skating and all that. I still skate uh, when I can. I've had a knee surgery and I'm a little bit busted up. Uh, motorcycle enthusiast and most recently I'm a competitive shooter shoot IPSC, USPSA, IDPA, and, and some other things there. Um, I don't ever believe in slowing down. Um, always work with what your body gave you, pay attention to your health, that kind of stuff. Somewhere in between the picture of me on the motorcycle there and the picture of me surfing at the bottom, uh, I went to graduate school. I got a master's degree in applied economics, a very heavy on multivariate calculus and statistics. Uh, and from there, I got a PhD in leadership, which is about 50% psychology, 50% group dynamics. Uh, and then that wasn't enough for me. I decided later to uh, add a master's degree in applied linguistics. So I've done all the coursework and I'm still working on my thesis. Uh, COVID kind of screwed that up for me and I took a little bit of a break. Uh, but the coursework is done and I'm always, always theoretically working on that thesis. We'll see. Um, so when I first moved home in December of 1994, I was working with our elders. I wanted to be an economic development specialist and everyone here just wanted to turn our residential school into a resort and a casino and a golf course. And I didn't want to do any of that. I thought that was a terrible idea. That did not fit in with what I understood to be uh, economic development and political economy, some of those things. So um, people, asked me, they said, what do you want to do? We're not going to do the kind of economic development strategies you want to pursue. So what, what's interesting to you? I never knew my father's parents, and I knew I had an opportunity to work with our elders. So I said, let me work with them. Let me use my voice there to uh, try and connect them to some of the ideas, uh, some of the funding, um, some of the science that will help uh, our elders, our knowledge holders, our language speakers, our cultural people stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the other people around them. 
And uh, the very first meeting that we had, some biologists came in and they came in and said, oh, there's a species of fish uh, in Columbia Lake, the headwaters. I'm from what used to be called the Columbia Lake Indian Band. So my community is at the most Columbia, uh, uh, the Columbia River that you could be at the very headwaters. And they came in and they told the elders, we want to name this fish, but we want to name it in Latin. And the old people, especially the couple of the old ladies that I had worked with the longest, were just outraged by that. And they said, why in the hell would we name that fish in Latin, a dying, a dead language, when we're desperately trying to save our language? Why wouldn't we recycle our knowledge into this scientific term so that it gives us a better chance of being able to preserve our identity across uh, space and time? And it was like a whole argument there. And they, they said, well, we're going to do this study and we're going to write it up and we're going to give you a report. And the old ladies pointed or they just turned around and pointed at the wall. And the wall was about 25, 30 feet long from floor to ceiling. And it was all three ring binders. And they said, we got enough of those. Nobody reads them. Those don't mean anything to us. That's not living data. That's something that comes here to die. But the information that we have encoded in our word for that species is emblematic of different families of animals, families of fish. The name that we have is very descriptive for what that fish looks like. That's living, breathing information. And that's how we maintain our science. We don't put it in a binder and put it on a wall that nobody ever reads. Um, so what I'm talking about here uh, is being able to work from a position of being empowered, not from a position of being told what to do. When someone tells us what to do, we tend to get all hackled up, we get emotional, we start screaming and yelling and pounding on tables and that kind of stuff. And I just don't think that's very useful. Sometimes it gets people's attention and maybe you can sometimes start uh, something moving in a direction. But the reality is relying on white guilt only lasts for so long. Um, what we're trying to do here is be part of a larger scientific discussion so that we can show that our culture, our language, our philosophy, our way of life is just as valid as uh, any other knowledge system out there, including Western science. So um, this is not our attempt to jump through Western hoops or change what we have to fit the rest of the world. Um, this is our attempt to demonstrate that uh, Kronacha is a robust philosophical ecosystem capable of conducting analytic conversations just like everyone else. Um, I'm going, I'm just trying to see if I can move some of, I got a, can't really see it here, but I've got uh, I got a bunch of Zoom menus right in front of what I'm trying to see. So I apologize if I pause. I'm trying to kind of look around those. Um, so I'm going to use a lot of visual data today. If you've ever seen me present before, you know that I use visual data because it allows me to speak uh, in a way that helps you to visualize ideas without looking at tables uh, or just collections of data. Um, data can be uh, overwhelming. I can't even, I can't even get my, I can't even close these windows. Uh, so uh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, data can be overwhelming because the phenomenon it describes uh, usually is reduced to number and then stored in large tables and analyzed by algorithms. Um, these processes tend to hide the value of the phenomenon. Uh, and researchers have in the past strategically used technical jargon and specialized software to explain to indigenous people that oh, well, we have the software and we know how to use it. So even if you don't understand it, we understand it for you. Uh, those kind of methods that are used to gather data uh, and models can depict, uh, depict information. It can be confusing if we're trying to look at a computer screen or we're trying to look at a table, uh, but visualizing uh, data is becoming more acceptable in the mainstream media, electronic social media and pop culture. Uh, one way to think about it is that visual data is more than just numbers was described uh, as uh, using thematic cartography, uh, which is a way of mapping critical themes to more recognizable images. Uh, artwork, uh, visual data is an art form because it uses um, contrast category to meet some aesthetic expectation. Uh, visual data, um, sorry, I'm getting a message now. I'm trying to, I literally, I can't see my, I can't see my cursor, so I can't grab anything um or do 
Like if I do, it just advances to the slide. So apologize for that. I'll just try to read around them. Um, uses stories uh, and also connection. Visual data uses connection to depict relationships, trees, and networks uh, to show how things uh, uh, are related to one another without necessarily having to get people to do a bunch of addition and dividing things and applying uh, different um, uh, mathematical constructs. Although I'm not saying don't go to school and don't study calculus. You absolutely need to do that. Um, there's always that meme that I wish someone would have told me that trigonometry wouldn't play a big role in the world when I was out there. It does. If you want to be the kind of person that can stand toe to toe with scientific researchers from around the world to help empower our subject matter experts, you absolutely do need to learn that language. But here's a nice example. This is just um, a screenshot from our uh, nation census. And it's just got some data in there. And that doesn't tell you a lot when you look at it. And these are kind of numbers that people would bring to our community members and then show them this and they'd explain why they were going to do something. And our community members would kind of scratch their head and they would say, it just looks like a table and it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. So we started doing things like this and saying, okay, here's the data and how's the, here's how the data maps out. Here we have income against education level. And if you want to tell your young people that going to school is worth it because they'll make more money, they'll actually make a lot more money, you can show a trend line here. And you can show that the more education you have, you get a steeper curve. You get a line there that shows that your income increases. And you can ask someone, how much do you think you're going to make on the current track that you're on? And you can, you can graph their dot on there. And you could say, now let's say you do two years of college. And you could show where that would be. And the trend would show that they could make more money there. Now, I'm not saying that's going to cause anyone to decide that they're going to go to school. But the more visual data, the more kinds of things that you have out there and about for people to be able to see and interact with, uh, then you might be able to make that long-term argument that supports that direction. Another thing that I like to use here are tag clouds. When we were trying to get people to take the census, people were saying, well, I can't be bothered with it. I heard it takes like an hour to do. There was a million excuses. And I would just show them this graphic. And I would say, uh, this is a, um, a graphic uh, that's called Tag Cloud. And the larger the name, the more of them are in the sample. The smaller the name, the fewer of them are in the sample. So where's your name on here? And someone... Uh, maybe from the Pierre family would look at it and say, oh, actually, our name is really small. So that means that there's not as many of us taking the census. And I would say, exactly. And they would say, well, how do we make it bigger? You need to get people from your family to participate. In a perfect world, we'd have 30 or 40 names, and they would all be the same size. So again, that idea of being able to use data um, helped to kind of um, bridge uh, that gap of people wanting to be involved but not really uh, knowing how. So starting off with culture, everyone has a different uh, description of culture, but because I'm an organizational theorist, um, I go with Edgar Schein's work, uh, Schein, uh, who wrote the book, if you, if you do an MBA program and you study culture, at some point you're going to study uh, Schein's work. Um, he describes culture as a shared system uh, or, or system of shared values that describes acceptable behavior, uh, provides stability by reducing uncertainty, uh, like if I was driving here today and one of the roads was blocked, I wouldn't like panic and lose my pretty little head and end up on the side of the road panicking. I would know that there's some way to deal with that uncertainty. I would probably look at Apple Maps and I'd find a route around there. I might call the nation council building and say, hey, the highway is shut down. Um, is there an alternate route? And we can reduce the uncertainty by having some of those stable patterns. Um, it organizes our activities. Uh, gives us a coherent narr uh, narrative. So when something happens, we can describe it in such a way that makes sense. It's not like this phenomenon that happens that we're always afraid of or we can't describe. Uh, gives us protocols. Um, one of the ways I like to describe it is that in our community, if you go to maybe Jason's house, you don't wear your shoes at his house. When you go to Ann's house, uh, you uh, don't swear at Anne's house. When you would go to Mary's house, um, there was a certain way you would conduct yourself there. And all of those things together, so all those protocols would help us to, to get by. What it does is it gives us the ability to experience things, to encode those experiences in the form of memories, to store those memories, not just in my head, but when we share that information, we share it in the collective memory. 
So when a problem solver from our culture needs help with something, they can recall that information. Hey, I know this one time you were studying place names and there's a story that has to go with the place name for that area. Can you share it with me? Now, all of that information that's been encoded is something that I can help make them aware of, puts them in a stronger position. They can retrieve that information. They can apply it to what they're doing. And if it's not the best, they can always adapt it. If it doesn't work at all, you abandon it. If it could be better, you adapt it. And if it's perfect, if it's optimal information, you use it just like you found it. And that's not just for math or science or uh, findings from research that you're doing. That's for everything, your philosophy, your place names, your creation stories, your religion, your world, everything around you can be passed on and adapted like that. So that's really key to maintaining our identity. For the Kanaka people, our coherent narrative has been uh, calibrated for between 11,000 and 13,000 years. It depends on who you ask. And archaeologists will tell you one thing and other scientists will tell you another and biologists will give you another estimate that's in left field. But the old ladies will say, we've been here since the time that animals were the people. When we talk about our oral history, that's uh, what that's called. Um, the four components that have given us that ability to tell a story that makes sense to us, that coherent narrative, our our language literally means the sounds that we make. All of those protocols, Jason, all those people that I talked about, those protocols for the individuals, you gather them all up and you add them together and that's all the protocols for everyone. Um, our oral history, uh, stories when animals were the people, and the way that we become wise, the way that we teach, the way that we take young people that don't have that knowledge, and then we give them specialized knowledge so that they can um, live a happier, healthier life. Here's one of those pictures. Here's a little bit of historic photo analysis. This young man is riding his own horse. He started off much like his uh, siblings being with their grandmother. And he started off with two or three or four kids on a horse with their grandmother. And he had to learn a bunch of these explicit rules, explicit teachings, so that someday he could take care of his own horse. Don't loosen the buckle here. Don't take that part off. Don't grab the ear. Don't stand behind the horse. All those things that if you've spent time around horses, you know you're not supposed to do. He had to learn them explicitly so that those became an implicit part of his problem solving toolbox. All the things that he needed to know to be a specialist with horses in the community, to take care of them, to be able to use them for their various uses. This young man would later go on to become one of our horsemen. And this is what culture did for him. It gave him all those explicit rules so they became uh, his implicit tools. Gives us every problem solving tool that we need. This man's working with his young children here, learning about that uh, sturgeon nose canoe. And yeah, I know everyone's building sturgeon nose canoes again. Uh, but the reality is the person that helped to bring that back for a lot of people, Sean Brigman, Sean learned how to make canoes that weren't scale models in our community. We invited him up. We showed him how you make those canoes from beginning to end. There were a bunch of places where he was stuck. And we showed them how to do those because it's what we do with our young people. One of the very first cultural activities I, I got to be a part of when I moved home was working with Wilford Jacobs to build a canoe out of what was a pile of wood at the People Center uh, in uh, Pablo, Montana. Uh, and he thought it was important because he knew that I was doing a lot of video. He knew that I was doing a lot of videography, working with the culture and the elders. He made me come in and put the camera inside of the canoe as we were putting the bark on, as everyone's hands were working together, as people were holding it and people were stitching it on. And he kept saying, don't stand back there and film from over there. Bring your camera right here to the front. I want you to see exactly what I'm doing because someday I'm not gonna be here to do this. And you'll have footage of every single step. So when we build these canoes with young people, we get to teach them about how our culture is robust. When you're forming the maple hoops that give uh, the hull its shape, sooner or later, someone breaks one. And we build these in the gym on the lower Kootenai Reserve and it just echoes through, right? And everybody stops, almost like those kids think they broke something and if I don't move, no one will know it's me and I won't be in trouble. And we tell them, hey, it's all right. 
It's okay. Our, our culture's robust. If you break one of those, we're, gonna, we're just going to get another people, piece of maple. You didn't ruin it. So then they are going to go get in the car. And we say, we're not even going to get in the car. We're going to give you these clippers. You're going to go halfway to Patty Jacobs' house. And on the right side of the trail, you're going to see a little maple sapling. Y'all Canadian, so you know what a maple leaf looks like. You need to cut one and bring it back. At the base, it has to be larger than an inch, smaller than two inches. And we send them out there, and they do their thing. And they learn that these are easy tools to pass between generations to the point where we're going to have them do it. And these kids come back carrying a little maple sapling like they're bringing back like a two-ton bison from the prairies. Like they're super proud. For some of them, it's the first time they got to do anything culture, um, anything cultural. And they come back and they're super excited. The same thing happens when they might break a piece of the uh, cedar cordage. And we tell them to go out the other door of the gym, walk to one of the cedar trees and kick the ground underneath. Pull up a piece of root. You can pull up meters at a time. My favorite is when they break some of the bitter cherry strapping, which is used for holding two flat pieces <laughs> uh, of uh, cedar and, and uh, maple together. And there's one tree right across the parking lot. And what they don't know is the way the grass is cut is it looks like it's you can walk right up to the branch, but it drops off. <laughs> so we watch them as they go and they're trying to reach out and we say, you'll see where the branch is cut and you're going to cut one foot. And we're going to get a couple of meters from that. And then we watch them as they all kind of fall into the ditch because of the way that it's uh, cut there. But they, they figure it out. And they find out that one person's got to hold on to another person as they lean over and then we're going to cut this off and they come back and they've done it on their own. And they're doing these things that allow us to maintain our identity across space and time. This is a picture from our last Sundance uh, in Canada. This is now a provincial park. Can't go here and pray the way that we used to. But that doesn't mean that we gave up on that ceremony or those songs. We continue to maintain them when we go to the sweat house, when we go to the roundhouse, when we have our ceremonies. All of that information that used to be used here is still used in our community. And we still go to that place. We just can't use it the same way that we used to. If we can maintain those ideas in our heads and our collective memory, then young people coming up behind us can rely on those so that we can uh, do some really interesting things. This is one of those graphics for kind of leadership and followership in our community. This is called the wing model or which is Gunaha. Uh, the wing model of cultural communication. We got a chief, we've got a whip. Uh, the whip is the person, the driver, the, the disciplinarian that makes things, make sure that things are happening the right way in our community. The chief has a right hand. I'm the right hand of the chief of the lower Kootenai band in our ceremonial settings. That's my official position. And then each of those families there is kind of aligned in a vertical kind of way of organizing to show that there's younger people at the bottom, there's older people at the top, the older people, those are your subject matter experts, those are your elders, those are the people that are most knowledgeable about our oral history, our language, our history, our hunting practices, our gathering practices. All of those people across there uh, represent their families. And when they all get together, that whole top group there, uh, you get a significant amount of cultural information. That information is passed down within families and to your apprentices and the people that are coming up uh, to learn these things. Uh, said that this is how we fill our hearts. We pass on what we've been given, what we have access to, to the people coming up behind us, solving those same kinds of problems. We keep an eye out for young people that we want to advance through those cultural processes that someday we want to be our chief, our whip, our right hand, those kinds of positions, our elders, our subject matter experts. And then young people are always encouraged to share ideas uh, back up that family ladder. Not all kids' ideas are great. If you've ever worked with kids, you know that not every idea is amazing. And sometimes it gets filtered out through your older siblings, through their older siblings, through your parents, through your grandparents, through your great-grandparents. But if there is a really great idea that young people have, it makes it all the way back up there. And that's how we recognize people for remembering those things, contributing those things. And what we get is this kind of generation of sharing information down and then testing ideas back up. And we get these processes. There's a really great book that's written on networks about the emergence of protocols. 
if you just take a snapshot of a network, it doesn't really do anything for you. But if you look at the way that they solve problems, we see that there are um, uh, that there are these protocols, these rules, these systems, these procedures that help us to understand the best way to manage that knowledge. Not every input that a young person has is going to be a home run, <laughs> but some of them are. And we take opportunities to help them refine that information. We pass information down. And this is where we kind of power our culture, this back and forth undulation, this ebb and flow of information within these family units where our heads of household, our subject matter experts, our elders um, bridge that information uh, to leadership. So another way to think about culture uh, is described in our community as which literally means there's something that one generation had uh, that was useful enough to give to the next generation to help them stand firmly or stand, um, uh, stand on solid ground is one way to think about it. And if we have this collection of people here and we start to link them together with that information uh, uh, the interactions that they have, the relationships that they have, what we get is the emergence of a couple of really important ideas. One, we see that those protocols for sharing information lead us to structure. Why is it that people are organized the way that they are? There are two important uh, parts of our cultural networks. They're the same in your community. They're the same in every single problem-solving community uh, across humanity. We tend to organize ourselves in ways that we have high clustering. So you can see there are these dense clusters of interacting people uh, where there are redundancies in those links. So if one person drops out of that cluster, the information can still be moved around that cluster. But more importantly, we have a few shortcuts through the middle. So we have low geodesics. It's not very hard to move information. Look at these two people, they're all the way on the opposite sides of the network and they're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, they're about eight links away. If you've ever played that game of telephone where kids all sit in a circle and the teacher whispers something in little Bobby's ear and then he's supposed to repeat it and go all the way around the circle. If you have 30 students, you're gonna get some entropy. <laughs> going to get some disorder, some distortion of that message. If you got a little punk rocker named Christopher in your class, I change that message completely every time. So when the message would get back to the teacher, they would be like, oh, that's interesting. That's not at all what we said. The more lengths you have to go through, the greater the chance of having distortion. It's also harder. To give you an example, my father was a co-owner of a house that burned down. And when they needed to tell him Nobody had his phone number, but they didn't panic and then just randomly start calling people. With like 8 billion people in the world, it would have taken forever to get a hold of him. So they jumped through the middle of that network. Someone said, well, I have Chris's number and he probably knows his dad's phone number. So let me just get a hold of Christopher. So in a matter of minutes, instead of years of randomly searching for Pete, we were able to let Pete know that there was a problem and who he needed to contact. All human problem solving groups are very efficient with their information, especially under times of change, under times of duress, and under times of challenge. We do things that we wouldn't otherwise do. So that's called de-differentiation. Sometimes we bring information underground. Sometimes we change the way our networks are arranged. Sometimes we change important aspects of our identity to make sure that the network is robust to make sure that we are able to continue to solve problems. Um, so I talked a little bit about this already, experiencing things, encoding information, storing it in the collective memory, allowing people to ask for help to solve problems, receiving the information efficiently for them, letting them apply that information and adapt it as they need. That lets us uh, become more efficient problem solvers. It gives us additive accumulation of knowledge. Um, it allows us to continually improve uh, the information that we have. Uh, that's what we call what one information, what one generation had, they gave to the next generation, which they can use to give themselves a more secure or solid footing. Um, it allows us to have the emergence of specialized, uh, specialization or succession, yuchak an kimik 
we're always training someone to take our place. That way, if something happens to me, there's someone there. We don't just lose all those things that I had. I've been training someone. Um, there's another word in there. One, nesukin, leaders that bring good things for us. And then, uh, no, there's one more on there uh, off the top of my head. I know I know it ends in kin there. Uh, and I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, that's our word for subject matter experts, people that gain this specialized knowledge so that they can become uh, more of a resource to the community. This allows us to have uh, increasingly specific units of analysis married to our environmental resources. Uh, all of the things that come from the land. So I'm going to take you on a little journey. I want you to imagine you're with a group of people. There's 10 or 15 of you. And without any protocols, if someone needs help with something and they throw out a question and there's not a set of rules to say what should happen, we can get what we call an information flood, which is just a flood of information. That's what we see here uh, on the left-hand side. That's where everyone just says what they have to say. There are no protocols that organize the information. This is very emblematic of Western power structures. Whoever's the loudest, whoever's the most, uh, whoever is the most repetitive, whoever's the most emotional, or whoever says, I'm the one that's right because I'm the expert in this area, right? <laughs> whoever thinks they're the most right usually ends up being the most right. We listen to them without even knowing why. I don't know why we listen to that guy. He was very passionate about it, right? If we look at Western models of leadership, trait theory, uh, and uh, some of those older skills theory, where the people that said they were had the, you know, the most right or the most knowledgeable, the most accurate, we just tended to listen to them, whether or not they were right or not. This is what happens when we have an information flood, and there's a lot of competition, and this is not very uh, equitable. Not everyone's voice on here is going to get committed to memory. We're probably going to listen to whoever's the loudest, who repeats themselves the most, who says that they're right, or who is the most emotional. When we started working with our elders and having a stronger position in the community, we said, how do we change that? And they said, in our language means one. It's the first thing that most people learn, because when you learn to count to 10, is number one. Ishwi is uh, our sign language. It's a, that's our word for heart, that first zone, that inner person that we are. Uh, this is our sign language for heart. And then Asha at the end comes from Nasha, which is a way of saying that it's a group of people. This is a group of people with one heart solving problems together. The Ishwi Asha problem solving setting uh, has a couple of rules. One person at the bottom will convene the meeting. They'll go to the chief and say, hey, I need to get people together to solve this problem. And the chief will think about it and work with all those heads of household, all those elders, all those specialists in the community with his, chief, with his uh, whip and his right hand. And they'll figure out, here's the 10 people, here's the 20 people, here's the seven people we want together. They just figure out these are the most knowledgeable. If you get invited to that meeting, which quite often for us happens in the sweat house or the round house or one of our other ceremonial settings, you'll sit in a circle and you'll make eye contact with one another. This is a wonderful property of the circle up to about 150 people. You can see what people are doing. You can look at their body language. You can hear their voice. You can remember details about them. Larger than 150, you start having trouble doing that. There are a couple of well-known case studies from business school uh, 3M was one of those groups. Uh, when their divisions got bigger than 150 people, they would compulsorily split them in half and have two 75-person units because they were more likely to have these connections between them so that if there was an argument, you wanted to stay with that person and continue to work it out. Bigger groups where you don't have that connection, there's an argument, you could just walk away and burn that bridge and not come back. But when you have the smaller uh, problem solving group, you get an idea if they're being honest with you, if they're being sincere, earnest, you can see how they're doing. The other thing that's important here is the way that you share information. 
you have two choices. Choice number one, I heard the ask for information. I don't have anything to add. I'm going to pass. That's okay. You can do that. We'll come back to you. If you want to bring up something later, you can do that. If you have something to say, it can take one of two forms. Number one, oh, I really like what you said. That's similar to the way that my family dealt with it. Um, that's what's in common here. This is what worked for us. Or that's interesting. That's different from what our community did. But we can learn something from this because there might be an important difference that allows us to um, keep that information healthy. But what you cannot do is tell someone to be quiet, tell someone they don't belong there because the chief invited them. You don't get to tell them, you don't get to talk over them. You don't try and get to point them out, shame them out. All those things that we do today when someone from our community has a good idea, all those kind of laterally violent crabs in a bucket kind of things that we see from unhealthy community members, well, they're not really from here. People still tell me this. You didn't grow up here. You're not really Donafa. <laughs> okay, I can speak the language. You lived here your whole life. And you don't know five words. Okay, yeah, you're right. Um, you don't get to try and shame people out. You don't get to tell them they don't belong here. You don't get to play heavy-handed cousin that knows everything when they really don't know that much. And you go in an orderly manner around that circle. You go around there and you get to crowdsource. You get to use the wisdom of the crowds to have a diverse group of problem solvers so that you can come up with an optimal domain of information. All the possible solutions that they give you. It's unbiased because we have uh, a diverse group of problem solvers. If everyone has the same background, the same education, the same experience, the same personality, the same problem solving heuristics, then you're going to get a very limited set of answers. And they're not going to be very accurate. If you don't believe me, you can study a field of mathematics uh, described as the diversity conjecture or the wisdom of the crowds, that a small group of experts will always be less accurate than a large group of independent decision makers that are a diverse body. Those biases cancel each other out and we get the best information after we've went around this circle and we've empowered that person that had that question that was brought together by the chiefs to give you the most knowledgeable people. And you'll see that every one of those people represents their families. Remember, this is a protocol where young people can give information and it moves up and then the protocols move down. We get this uh, very refined information so that we get this great problem solving information. Maybe it's a song, maybe it's an extract from a root, maybe it's a particular idea from the culture, maybe it's a story, whatever it is, that resource has now been given to you to solve your problem to do the kinds of things that you need to do. And we still do this all the time. The room that I'm in right now is where we do this with our leaders, our department heads, our program managers. The room right above me is the new space for the traditional knowledge and language advisory, which is our group of elders. And when we have a new program, when we're going after funding, when we have to have a communication with one of our neighboring tribes, where we have to make a program decision about something, it starts with them. And we have that department head, that manager, that researcher sit at the head of the table. And then they say, this is why I'm here. This is what we're doing. I'd like your input. And we go around that circle. In this picture, we have our program manor, managers. We have two sector directors all sitting at the table with those elders working on these things together. And there's always a really long, what most Western managers think is a boring waste of time in the morning. Why is everyone just sitting here for an hour? Because they're speaking the language and they're doing that social thing and they're making connections with one another and they're trying to bring back these ideas that are millennia old and translate them into English. That's not an easy thing to do. So if they need that soft start in the morning and they need the lunchtime to do that, then that's what we need to do. And don't talk to them about being behind schedule. That's not very appropriate. When we work with outsiders, this is what it looks like. We've, we see we've still got our uh, communicators there. Uh, that, that person that is the, at the bottom of the circle there uh, has been contacted by an external researcher. That external researcher uh, has got a hold of someone from the community and said, hey, we want to do this research. 
It used to be that they would show up and they would be at the bottom of that circle and they would come in and they would do what Linda Tuahi Smith says is archetypal colonialism, where they would say, we're going to take your special indigenous knowledge and we're going to draw it back to an imperial center, usually universities. We're going to re-encode it into science talk or Western speak or Western science hypotheses or Latin. And then we're going to push that back onto you and then just tell everyone by these three ring binders behind us that this is what we're doing. Well, we don't allow people to do that anymore. If you're going to do research and you're going to involve us, we have someone that is the buffer between our intellectual knowledge holders, our elders, fluent language speakers, and you, you're going to give your idea to our person at the bottom of that circle, and they're going to go around that circle. We did this uh, uh, with uh, some CIHR funding where an external researcher uh, who I got to supervise as a doctoral student doing a postdoc said, hey, I'd like to change the way federal health research happens. Would you be interested? My community was just like, heck yeah, we would. So they sent that question to me. And I sent that question around with the elders. How do we change health research? And the elders came up with specific questions. And I just gave those questions back to the researcher. And then what do you do? They send the responses back to, to me. We go around that circle. We do this several times until our elders are comfortable enough with the, um, the topic with the information that they don't feel like they're being talked down to, right? There's not a three ring binder. There's not a graph. It's not a spreadsheet of data that they're given. There are ideas that are transferred between the research community and our philosophical, our cultural, our spiritual leaders so that everyone's on the same page before we start. We've refined those ideas. Everyone knows what's going on. Everyone now is in an empowered position to ask questions and make suggestions, to pose alternative hypotheses. This is science. This is just, there's no such thing as Western science or indigenous science. There is science that's looked at through different perspectives. This encompasses both perspectives. This allows us to refine the most um, important, uh, the most sensitive, and the most specific information from our community and match it up to the most refined and most specific Western information there is. Because if that is valid for both of us, that's better science. If it's only valid for one of those two groups, it doesn't mean anything outside of that group. If it's valid for both, that becomes really important. Here is our current chief administrative officer for the Nation Council when she uh, was a department and had, sorry, a sector director working on her master's thesis, going in front of the elders saying, here's my research. I want to be a subject matter expert. I'm getting my master's degree and it can't just be at Royal Roads University. I have to come here and apply these ideas here. And she gave her research questions to this group and they went around that circle and they refined that and they asked her questions and she went back to her institution. And we did that thing where we ended up at the end of the day with this reciprocally calibrated information. I work from the Tunaja perspective and work from the Western University perspective. And this thesis was able to make some very strong conclusions about bringing up the next generation of leaders in our community. Then for us, everything really changed uh, early 1900s. Um, you'll notice that the men are gone. Literally, um, young boys would be lined up at the fence line at St. Eugene's. And a priest would point out their male relatives, talk about how they were worthless, they weren't good farmers, they were never going to school, that they were drunks, that they were never going to mean anything to, to society. You didn't ever want to be like that. The men uh, served in World War I, World War II, the Korean War, uh, and many Canadians actually moved uh, to the States from our community um, to serve in uh, Vietnam, Desert Storm, and, and other actions, the global war on terror. The, the men just essentially, many of them, their worth, for, their purpose, their, their worthfulness was gone. Um, we were replaced by the uh, Indian agent and, of course, the man in his robe with his collar. 
the kids are no longer doing the kinds of things that they're supposed to do, learning. Their mothers are clutching their babies, hiding their babies inside the lodge. Kids aren't running around learning how to ride horses or make canoes. All of that changed dramatically. Uh, this is not a picture from our community. This is from one of the residential schools in the interior. Those kids now are no longer learning how to solve problems by sitting in a circle in the sweat house. They're no longer going to our New Year's dances. They're not going and talking to the translators anymore. They're lined up in a grid. They can see uh, no more than one other person. They don't see everyone. The only voice they're hearing is the sister, and they're all looking at a little cross with a man hanging on it uh, on the wall across from them. Um, there was this period where for all indigenous people, and I'm not just talking about in Canada or North America, uh, but I'm talking about New Zealand, Australia, uh, all throughout Africa, other non-indigenous populations like the working class poor in Ireland that went to the industrial schools there. Uh, we're also talking about what happened in the former Soviet Union uh, under communism when their churches were taken away uh, and their local dialects were taken away. Um, those people were all reprogrammed. There was a massive increase in entropy. What it looked like in North America was kill the Indian, save the child, kill the Indian, save the Christian. Uh, that was a term championed by Colonel uh, Pratt at the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. And these are kids from that school. And some of us here might have kids. If you don't have kids, um, you at one point were a kid. Uh, and you know what it's like to work with kids um, to try and get them to take a picture. And there's a one universal truth that the more kids there are, the exponentially harder it is to get them to do the same thing, like smile or say cheese or stop nudging the person next to you or joking around or whatever it is you're doing. But there's like 1,200 kids in this picture, and not one of them is smiling. And it's a well-known picture. There's been a number of historic photo analyses on this picture. None of these kids are smiling. Something horrific is happening here. Uh, something fundamentally genocidal is happening here. And there's always someone that doesn't, they're like when I teach in rural BC, there's always some guy that's got his, you know, chew can circle in his pocket and he's got his big belt buckle and he's like, well, why didn't they just fight back? I don't believe any of this. I would have just fought for my kids. And then we have to tell him that, that you, you would have went to jail for that. <laughs> You would have been ostracized uh, by the priest if you would have done that. You would have lost even more of your rights because there was an Indian agent that was in charge of everything that you did. And then when someone's talking about this thing, why don't you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps? We show them this picture. And at first they don't understand. And they think, well, you know, I, I would have been strong enough. And then you have to tell them, how about when you were eight? Because these handcuffs are the cuffs that were for kids that ran away from the school. These aren't for the parents, tough guy. <laughs> this is for the kids. One of the ideas that I talk about a lot is the law of requisite variety. Law of requisite variety um, says that any system can maintain itself if it can generate one more solution than the total number of challenges. Think about going out and hunting. You, if there are five animals that might cause you harm, you have to have a strategy to survive every one of those animals. And then you need one more strategy to just exist. That is an idea that comes from uh, early artificial intelligence studies. You have to be able to generate more strategies than the threats you face. I worked with a man named Pete McCoy, who was a residential school survivor. And one day before, uh, a long time ago, before St. Eugene's was, um, the hotel that it is today and the casino. I remember we were talking about how he felt about it and he was telling me his experiences. And he said, one of the things that was his favorite thing to do was to try and beat the priest home. He ran away multiple times. He was well known for running away. And he would say, all I needed to do was find a new route home because he would know where I beat him last time and he'd be waiting there for me. So if I crossed the river at Wardner, I knew I needed to cross the river somewhere else. If he was waiting at this junction at Galloway, I knew that I had to find a way around that. And he would say, even if I made it home, it wasn't really a victory because I know he was there. He would show up there. I know that I'd have to go back to the school and I'd be in trouble. But that was an important part of my identity and my survival. Even if every year I could run away and I could make it home, 
That is the law of requisite variety. And a young boy at the residential school realizing that something was horrifically wrong, continuing to fight against these systems around him. He, by the way, became one of our most important subject matter experts and helped to write one of the books that we still use every day in our community on plant use and gathering. This whole process uh, was described as uh, fundamentally genocidal. Um, George Tinker was an indigenous scholar whose father uh, was uh, a missionary educator, soul damaging or soul wounding. Those were a couple of uh, healthcare experts working with indigenous people, um, crushing individual energies. And then one that came, I think, from a dissertation that I stumbled across, the most important that I've ever seen. This process was a way of depleting the collective immune systems of indigenous communities. You just destroy those systems so that this group, with all of its knowledge and its connections and its ability to share and hold one another up, is unable to share. Albert Leslo Badabashi would say that you kill a network by cutting the ties. You simply make your network actors non-communicating islands. Because if you can't share, you now have to solve every problem from first principles on your own, and that's not easy to do. You can't ask for a question to be answered by the collective identity of your community. You can't ask for that help anymore. You have to come up with every problem in an agonizingly slow fashion by yourself. Networks have been studied in all kinds of different frameworks. Support, information, sharing, storytelling. A couple of my favorite are Fortune 500 companies. They all share members of their boards of directors. They're all networked together. <laughs> There's no idea for one huge corporate conglomeration, they're all sharing these different boards of directors and the specialized information so that they can do things for the industry that's best for everyone. Another one, somebody one time did a network of hugs, right? How do you, what's the most basic form of showing uh, support to someone? Give them a hug. So someone did a study of networks, how people were hugging. Every one of these links would be a hug between these people. I took my family to Experience Music Project in Seattle one time, and they all knew that I used to be in a bunch of bands, and I still do music, but I used to be in a bunch of bands. We toured all over the Northwest, and I was, it was an important part of my, my bringing up. And when we got to EMP, they had this huge display, and it was the network of grunge music out of the Pacific Northwest. And I was in hardcore bands and punk bands and straight edge bands. I wasn't in grunge bands, so I wasn't in there. But a ton of people that I knew were in there in bands that we played shows with. I was only one link away from those, from being in like this pinnacle of Northwest hardcore, Northwest grunge, Northwest music. Networks can be thought of as a way of holding everyone together. And if you want to kill that network, you, you just cut the ties. If you want to stifle a network, you just put a new person in charge. It was like 1956, there was a provincial law passed that said that the residential school superintendent would now be the legal guardian of all the children under his care. Your parents are no longer your parents. It was this other person. You could think of this as being the Indian agent who was in charge of all of the funding, who was in charge of determining who got supported. It was uh, the person that was in charge of determining who got a certificate to leave the reserve. Because remember, we couldn't legally leave the reserves for a significant amount of time, not even to go to other funerals and other communities. This could be thought of as the priest who at one point was the person when a woman went in to give uh, uh, birth to their child, whether or not she was sterilized was up to the priest. And they would ask the priest, uh, is this person uh, from, uh, uh, from, from a legal, formal, uh, official relationship, meaning were they married in the church? And if the priest said no, there was a chance that woman would never have a child again. You undo 13,000 years of order, of problem solving, of history, all of those protocols, by cutting the ties and forcing other actors in there and telling the whole world, if you're gonna be a part, you've gotta do it this way. If you wanna help save your language, you've gotta you got do what First Peoples Cultural Council tells you. 
If you're going to do this, you have to do what the UN or what parliament or whatever, this federal cabinet or whoever, you got to play all of these rules and all of these rules require research and process and protocols and procedures that don't represent your community. So we get this long history of fighting back, being activists and raising awareness. And that was all good. That was all good. We still have some active out there. Um, and that's great. I'm not saying we don't need them, but I'm saying we would probably benefit from instead of having one more really well-known popular social media activist to having one more doctoral student in that area that they want to make change. Now you'll notice in this slide, we've still got that imposed entropy, that disorder, but we also have brought back those red links that are in there. To me, Decolonization is not about trying to take away all of those parts of colonial structures that we're never going to do that. You're never going to get all of the white people to move back to England, no matter how much you want. You're never going to get parliament to go away. You will probably always have the queen on your money. That's just the way that it goes. But if you can find a way to move information around in those very old ways, with those specific abilities to adapt and have new tools, then those other things can exist and you can exist and you can in fact become stronger by adapting some of your old deep structures, your traditional tools to match those other tools. Um, I do this whole thing, I don't wanna to go too much into it, but I do this whole, I don't know if anyone played Tetris, but in the, in the early eighties, when I was like a kid and I first started working, I was an agricultural worker, which was not my favorite work, but I got enough money to play Tetris and skateboard. Like, that was like my whole thing. And I played Tetris and I started to learn a lot about problem solving. I knew that if I looked in my peripheral vision at the next piece coming down and I saw the color, then all I needed to know was what color it was to move the seven pieces into one of its each four orientations to move it into the open gap. There's seven pieces, there's four ways that you can move them. These are the 28 possibilities. And I got really good about using those protocols. What color is it? Oh, if it's a square, it's in the same orientation in any direction. But if it's aqua, then it's a stick and it's four pieces and those are highly sought after. And you can start thinking about how to move them in there. But what happens if we take those shortcuts out? My brother had a Game Boy. And one day I heard the music for Tetris and he said, hey, do you want to play Tetris? And I said, I'll destroy you with Tetris because that's how you are with your, your younger siblings. <clears throat> Well, what I didn't know is it was grayscale. The colors were all gone. <laughs> he destroyed me in Tetris that. He still teases me about that. Thought I was going to be so good at playing Tetris, but it changed everything. Every strategy, every protocol, every procedure, every way of calling data and using it to solve problems went away. And this is that entropy, that disorder. Let's just change all the pieces. Let's make it so every piece is colored the same way in any orientation. Let's just randomly put pieces together. Let's make them 3D. Or the worst, let's change the shapes and the colors. If you know everything you can know about those 28 shapes and orientations and where to move them and solve problems, this will cause you to melt down really quickly. This is a massive increase in entropy. This is the disorder. This is the long-term effect of colonization on every system that you, your family, your community, your community's leadership structure, your specialized knowledge, all of that. We are fighting all of this every day. And it's not, it's not gonna go away. We're not all gonna ride horses to work anymore. I, I drove in from Spokane that would take me like a week on a horse, <laughs> probably longer, because I haven't been on a horse in like 10 years. But I've gotta find other things at work and adapt them and speak my language and talk to my people and be able to spend time and build community members up so that we can work with those other systems that cause all that entropy. Uh, if you're interested in this study, especially if you wanna to go to school for things like psychology, sociology, if you're thinking about med school or going into health research, this is under the field of study called collective trauma. Um, the collective trauma uh, traumatizes a group at the collective level. It's a sociological process. Uh, it, it involves collective identity revision, not just an individual. We're not traumatizing an individual. Every single person from every single family and every single community went through the same process. 
having our children taken away, having our subject matter experts, our elders disrespected, having our traditional information dispossessed of our community and drawn back into a very imperial academic setting and then forced back on us. Nobody escaped that. So stop pretending we did. <laughs> uh, collective trauma follows a traumatogenic event. In my community, it was St. Eugene's. Uh, it was the Indian Child Welfare Mechanism, the 60s scoops. It was that whole process of removing specialized information from who we were so that we were better cogs in a generic Canadian structure. The Canadian Constitution, Western churches, English only administration, those did not help us. But finding ourselves in those systems, it was rapid, it was overwhelming, it was sustained, it was far, far reaching. And it caused every system to kind of be turned upside down. That uh, entropy was absorbed by the social fabric of our community. Every single problem solving tool was turned upside down. Everything got much harder to do. When I first moved home, I didn't understand why when someone would ask about Indian names, it turned into an argument. I didn't know when I came home and I asked people about, man, I didn't even know my grandparents and I lived really close to them and I never met them but you live a block away from your grandparents and you haven't talked to them in like three years what's going on and everything would melt down and people would start yelling and crying and people would start talking about well one time 20 years ago my mom said this that my aunt did that and it was all these like amazingly intricate information structures that don't help anyone and I was like man, I would have given anything to meet my grandparents like one time. That's the kind of massive systemic entropy that caused us to question everything that was going around. So what did we do? I'm gonna skip forward to a couple of things here. Um, I'll come back to this one if we have time. So what did we do? We decided, hey, we gotta start being in charge of our own stuff so we can have empowered people. Because when we're empowered, when we're competent in something and we interact over it, we're much more confident. And when we interact confidently, we're less likely to break down, cry, become emotional, become hysterical, to throw tables, to throw chairs, to do some of those basic problem solving things that our people could do 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. And so we decided to start building people up. Remember the discussion of that fish? in the animal families. This was a workshop here, right, actually right above in one room over, where we said, we're gonna have a workshop on how our language can empower our people. We got them there. And what it really was, was the basics of interacting over the language so you don't break down. And they are all working on a rough draft of the poster that we came up with, was our seven animal families and how they all fit into those families and what they were named and what the primary physical characteristics are. This is indigenous science. This is our genus and species and all of that same kind of thing that they do in Latin and from a biological perspective. This is us just saying, hey, ours is just important. This is just as important what anyone else is doing. And when we look at words in Latin given to animals, it's describing them. So we would go through. Just a really quick, um, a couple of the important ones as we talked about uh, the sounds we make to one another. Shuk is the verbal stem that means sound. Shuk. Well, we have several animals that have shuk in their name. And why do they have shuk in their name? And I asked for people, why do you think? And they started guessing. No, shuk in the loon. Why is it called? Why do we call it that? because it makes a special sound. There's nothing random about our community. It was increasingly specific information over thousands and thousands of generations so that we could stand more firmly in this part of the world. The other one that I love is Kiakacho, the falcon. And no one could figure that one out. The falcons dive at 200, 200 kilometers an hour and their wings make a specific whistling sound because of the way the feathers vibrate. There's something important about that. Nothing is random. And then we started taking this discussion and putting it online on some closed bound systems online on Vimeo where people can go and learn this stuff because it's basic cultural information that you should have known, but you're afraid to ask for. And if someone has it that you don't know, you're afraid that they're going to do that lateral violence. Okay, cool. 
We'll just put it online. You want to watch it and learn about it? Here it is. You can have the link. So now you know a little bit more about it and you can become a subject matter expert. And then we started taking some of those cultural discussions, like 30 years of hardcore, difficult conversations with elders that are all gone now. And we just put them on my Vimeo. And this was one of those hidden folders. You have to have the link to get here. You have to have the link to the individual video. We make this information, we make these links available to the communities, to the families that those people are from. We have hundreds and hundreds of hours of this kind of information to build people up. So that if you're going to go to school to become a fisheries biologist, a hydrologist, an archaeologist, an economist, any of those, there's someone from your community talking about these ideas. And we'll connect you with that. So that as you go to school and you become more empowered to do these things, whether you're going to med school or law school, you also understand our understanding of health and wellness and bodies and disease, our understanding of laws and protocols and procedures, so that you can have this structural equality between Western tools and indigenous tools so that you become a subject matter expert, not just in Western law, but you're also a subject matter expert in this cultural information. Um, these are some of the meetings where we have researchers working directly with our elders, directly with. You need to come in and take direction here. I don't care what textbook you have. I don't care what world expert in whatever you're going to school for you interact with. I've had a lot of those. I've had world-class professors, and I've still learned more from these people here. And if you're going to learn how to figure out how to translate those ideas, it's from these folks. We did one time, people couldn't figure out why we were having trouble doing genealogy. And the reason was because we had a genealogist that came and spent time in our community in the early 1990s. I talked to her one time and I listened to like two sentences that came out of her mouth. And in my head, I was like, I will never do an interview with you because you're doing it wrong. She told me she was an expert. Um, she told me that she made decisions about data and that she and the institution would own the data. And then I found out that she was a master's student. She didn't even have a graduate degree yet. And she showed up all high and mighty trying to own our intellectual property. And I just said, you're the epitome of everything I'm trying to undo. <laughs> Good luck. I'll be on the other side of the conversation. And what she ended up doing was hurting a lot of people's feelings. For some people, the only specialized traditional knowledge they had left was what they knew about their family. One of my cousins was looking at what was written about our family and said something like, hey, this says that one of my parents killed the other parent, like murdered them. That can't have happened because one of them died before the other. And this is logically impossible. And the genealogist would not correct the data. Well, I have to do an analysis and I have to talk to my advisor. And after I was like, oh, you're done. Uh, it wasn't long before that person was made to leave the reserve that she was working on. And the chief said, you will turn over all of your data. If you want to make copies of it, you can. You're done here. Your time is done. And you will leave all of your original data with us. And for at least a decade, we did not talk about genealogy. So as a complexity theorist, we had a workshop that was um, something about learning a little bit about a bunch of different important things, singing, dancing, family history. So at one point, we had everybody sit out and we gave them sheets of butcher paper. And as a complexity theorist, you study systems where there's not a set of rules that should tell you what should happen. And I went and I was sitting, I was sitting with uh, Steve Wood and Chief Jason Louie because Steve was there talking to people about singing. And we were sitting there and uh, Steve's a pretty smart guy. And we were, he knew it was an experiment and he was looking at it and he was just like, oh, hey, well, what's your, uh, what's your hypothesis? And I said, Sooner or later, people sitting there working on their genograms by themselves are going to realize that they're much more effective if they start working with other people. And so we just kept watching. And we we're trying not to let anyone know. I was using the camera on my phone to watch people without looking at them. And sooner or later, one of the old ladies stood up and she put her hands on her hips. She makes a, she picks her genogram up. And she, I remember she like yelled out to me, I'm a and sit by my cousin because this is silly <laughs> and like magic right and then another person did it another person did it and then my family who had these deep-seated animosities about western genealogy 
started working together and came up with amazing genograms. Not only were they comfortable working on them, but at the end of the day, without us telling them, they all taped their genograms to the wall. And we saw this diversity of visual data that tied us all together. More importantly, people wanted to share that information and they hadn't done this. This was a hard thing to talk about. I never met my grandparents. I don't know jack about jack about my family. And here I could see back like seven generations. It was amazing. So as they were, and I remember we were supposed to go for Chinese food after this and ginger beef, Calgary ginger beef is a big thing in my community. I remember chief was getting frustrated and they were going and they were, finally he started turning off the lights and he was like, we're going to be back tomorrow. You don't have to leave, but we got to turn, we got to go, we got to go and eat. But it was an amazing thing because it showed us when you put us in charge of this information, that there are some amazing things that we could do. Another really just a beautiful thing from the perspective of a network scientist. If you would get to the end of some of those genograms at the edge of the page, you would see notes like, go to the page from Bonner's Ferry, such and such family. This is how we're connected to them. We're only one generation away from them. And then you go to their genogram and there's an incoming link and a reciprocal link back that says, this is how we're related to so-and-so from the Lower Kootenai Band. This is how we're related to so-and-so from the Tobacco Plains Band. And people from Akiskano and Tobacco Plains would have links going down to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. So doing away with, from an empowered perspective, with subject matter experts that were empowered to connect people in a way they'd never been connected before, they were doing it. It was amazing. It was a beautiful thing to see. So beautiful that when we started showing them some of our network graphics and how people were created, this was from an online network. I stole a bunch of Facebook's ideas and we had a bunch of people interacting over the language. And we started showing, this is B59. Remember I told you that Indian names were really hard to talk about in person. This was a blog on that online social network about Indian names. And by far, there were more people talking about this. 13 people commented uh, something, something like 16,000 words total shared about it. Connecting people, people were told some of the names from their families. These were things that in person we couldn't do, but online we could do because we were still having a little bit of that problem, some of that trouble with some of our subject matter experts feeling like they weren't valued still feeling disrespected by Western academia. And so two things happened. One, we showed them, hey, if we can talk about this online, why can't we talk about it in person? The other thing that was really beautiful was my auntie here, uh, Dorothy Alpine, came up to me when this was, I was projecting this on the wall. And she came up to me and she said, which dot am I? I was like, oh, auntie, technically I, I can't, I'm not supposed to tell you because it's anonymous. But if you want to know, I'll tell you. And so I showed her which one she was. And then her sister came over and her sister wanted to know. And the next thing you know, their sister wasn't there, but they were like, I bet we can figure out who our sister is by the number of times she commented. And it was just a beautiful thing because people were using math and science and specialized Western tools as much as they were using genealogy and and those kinds of things that tell us who we are. And they were finding this way to make them structurally equivalent. So where do you go from here? I want to show you a couple of pictures as I close out here. Uh, this was a formal genealogical workshop that we did. And the name for this language, I can't remember if this was I think was the name of this one, which is a word in our language that means that everything has its place, everything belongs, uh, because it's connected by our language and our culture. And this is at our roundhouse where we have our ceremonies, where we bring in our New Year's, uh, where we have our workshops, where we have our support groups. And this was the first workshop that we had there. It was on genealogy. This was at the end of the first day. You can see everyone has their genograms up on the wall. There were, between the two events, there were something like 26 genograms and only one person chose not to leave theirs up. And I don't, I don't know why we didn't really ask them. Um, this was a person from our community that used to be in charge of membership. And there's going to be people out that are like, oh, we hate our membership clerk. And people are always mad about that kind of stuff because it's an overarching colonial Western structure that's meant to break our communities down and not really connect them. But this woman has so much specialized knowledge with helping people get their children and their grandchildren enrolled 
and establish those connections. And I asked her, hey, do you want to come and do a presentation? And she said, people usually don't like to hear what I have to talk about. And I said, yeah, but there's like 50 people in the community that are trying to figure this system out. And you have the key to the puzzle. So she started doing a presentation and she was maybe 20 minutes in, a bunch of hands came up and it was that thing, it was that emergent process as, as a complexity theorist. I knew something was getting ready to emerge. And instead of people being mad and angry and yelling and all that, they started saying, okay, here's a situation with one of my grandchildren. And they started talking about it and they started sharing solutions to get people to figure out the right resources, where to apply, where to find some of that information. My own family, one of my brothers who was born in Canada, was adopted in the States, does not have paperwork, paid into social security his entire life. And now they won't give him his social security because he doesn't have a birth certificate. So here we are trying to figure out how to do these because we have a Western subject matter expert that's Donaha. <laughs> who's helping people make these connections in other areas. Um, here is my cousin. Uh, here's my cousin who brought up the issue with what was written about her parents in the data. And here she is looking at our genogram with her aunt who also grew up in the States that was born in Canada, moved to the States, was not connected, recently came home. And here she is looking at her family. And I want to point out that that post-it note there, someone from another family in our community came over and said, hey, we know you didn't really get to meet your grandparents and we know you don't know a lot of this, but here's an Indian name from your family and it has to do with this branch and it was the oldest son from this family and this person is gone now, but it should go to their oldest sibling. And these are the kinds of things that people aren't always really good um, at sharing. Uh, so we've got about eight uh got about eight minutes left i want to just show really quickly uh, these are all some these are all our subject matter experts in family in genealogy uh and working on this this is uh a woman that works with community members on genetic conditions because we like most communities we weren't encouraged to tell people who we were related to and for a long period, not only were all of our names changed by Father Pokola at St. Eugene's, but for many of our families, our names changed every generation. Um, your father's first name would become your last name if you were male, and your father's, first, your father's last name would remain your last name if you were female. I remember I asked one of the elders one time, why do you think they did that? And she just yelled out, so we would never know who we were, who we were related to. This is one of those women in our community that talks about, I didn't know, this is how I found out, this is why it was important. Here are some health concerns, here are some larger community health considerations. These aren't comfortable things to do, but when we find these people and we build them up and we empower them and we put them in positions to share what they know, they can do some amazing things. The last one that I wanna show you, I mentioned that we had uh, a Western researcher that contacted me to work with the elders to try and figure out a way. We did that reciprocal calibration thing and they said, hey, we wanna change CIHR funding in a few really positive ways. And our elders wanted to do that. So we worked on that reciprocal calibration and we did a bunch of research. And at the end of it, we told the team hey, if you want to give the information back to the community, it has to be a feast. And the number one thing that the elders said needed to be changed was the CIHR prohibition on spending grant money on food because that was a rule. And the researchers said, we'll find a way to get around it. We got that changed. And instead of bringing back three ring binders or emailing a PDF to the community, we brought leadership from every community together, from Interior Health, we brought people together from the local hospital, our health programs, our child and family services society, and we had a feast for them to give them the research, but also a feast because that's the way it has to happen. And we managed to have that event where we gave this data back at the same time we did our Bitterroot Feast. In the foreground are our knowledge holders, including our Bitterroot Chief, which was one of those um, highly specialized uh, subject matter experts. And in the background are the kids running up the road. They're kicking up the dust. How often do kids get so excited for something that they kick up the dust? 
we got to teach them about conservation, carrying capacities, dangers of over harvesting. We got to teach them about food preparation, peeling the roots and all of that. And then we came back and handed out uh, our data and then had a feast. And it was awesome because I remember telling the ladies, hey, we're taking some pictures, so don't, don't, don't look into the camera and try not to look like you're smiling. And of course, that made them all really start laughing really hard. That's Gina trying to dish up the bitter root there. And she's, <laughs> I remember she was saying, I'm trying not to laugh right now, but it wasn't um, very easy for her. Um, this project was where this kind of iconic photo came from. This is just like Wilfred asking all of us to put our hands uh, on that white pine bark to hold the hull of the canoe up while one person sewed it. Um, this is all of us holding up our bitterroot while we were in the field. Um, there are three generations here. There are diabetic hands here. There are arthritic hands here. There are hands that belong to survivors of the residential school process. And there are hands of people that will be our future subject matter experts. The last thing that I wanna say and my conclusion here well, number one, um, this is our team that worked on that project, but more importantly, uh, we received the first inaugural uh, BC Reconciliation Foundation Award for this research. This is our, her honor, uh, Janet. She allowed me to refer to her as Janet. She greeted me in our language and she spent some time here with us, but more importantly, she spent some time with our subject matter experts and if you're still out there saying, well, none of this really applies to me, I'm gonna just read off in closing a list of some of the subject matter experts in our community that we're trying to bring back. And I guarantee you, you only have to do a five minute interview in your community to find similarities or additional subject matter experts. Nasukin, the chief, the deer chief, the duck chief, the war dance chief, the black tail chief, the bitterroot chief, the fish chief, the sturgeon chief, the right hand, the whip man, the crazy dog driver, the crazy dog whip, the crazy dog chief, the horsemen, the medicine people, the history holders, the storytellers, and the song keepers. We've just got a couple of minutes left, but if there are any questions or comments, I would love uh, to hear them. Again, I wanna thank you for spending your time here with me. You could have been anywhere on the planet today and you're in Zoom land here with me, allowing me to stand in front of our nation vision statement and our building, the place where we're trying to do this. I'm profoundly thankful to UBCLC uh, and to all of you that reached out to uh, make this happen. So thank you very much. Hey, Dachas. Thank you, Christopher. That was a really great talk. Um, we have quite a few questions here. I have a really long question, so bear with me. Um, <laughs> We have a question from the guest. It says, sorry for going back to the census tag, but how does the tag cloud visualize take into account family size? Um, a larger family will likely have more participants, so it might not be reflective on engagement by the family, but family size. Also, 100% participation of a family has that, that has 10 adults will always be represented as smaller than 20% of the family of 100 adults telling that smaller family or perceived smaller family based on inclusion by last name to encourage each other to participate more won't increase that visual representation. It doesn't take into account family structure disruptions, residential schools renaming by the church, um, 60 scoop removal into care urbanization, the representations we make promote this and support might replicate rep misrepresentation or perceived over uh, under representation. Yeah, I, I, all of that I agree with. Um, so first off, that's an applied mathematics question for good on you for being a future subject matter expert in applied mathematics. Uh, there's some sampling theory issues. That particular graphic was used when we were sitting at our um, annual general meeting. And we were trying to get people to participate and they wouldn't. So we were trying to find people whose family name was smaller. The more important question there is the way mathematically that I would do that is we would we know who our community members are. And we know how many people are in each family. So we could do some proportional sampling, get into some uh, probability theory with proportional uh, sampling theory. But I had another graphic 
and I wasn't sure which one to use. And in retrospect, after that question, I would have used it. And it shows uh, our four Canadian communities. And in that one, we had an M and an F on each community for male and female. And the M was smaller in all of them. So it doesn't matter exactly how many men or women, it was by percentage people from your community participating. In one community, you could hardly see the M. They had 17 women and I think two men. And one of the guys was his same kind of question. Well, why is it that this and that? And, I, and this was a guy that was on council. And I said, you want to know why? Because we came to your house and you didn't want to do it. These visual data are pushing people into a different direction. When you get into the deeper analysis uh, that we came up with from that census, all of that kind of control for that sampling bias, we have models that took that into consideration. This was something that was meant to push people into participation. And I can tell you, the next time we did the census, that same man who was mad that his M was so little in his community, but refused to be a part of the census, became one of our census takers. And we got much better participation uh, from a proportionally sampled population from his community. So that's a beautiful question. And yeah, that graphic, again, visual data is intended to give people some broad qualitative themes that motivate people to be a part next time. And we did, they definitely did that. Some of the other work that we did, control for sample bias, when it comes into feeding some of the econometric models, yeah, all of that stuff was in there, uh, but good, that's a good question. You should be asking more Western researchers those questions because it causes people to see, oh, there's probably a better way to do it. And this is a good place to start that conversation. So yeah, thank you for that question. Um, our next question is, as a non-Indigenous person, how would the elders of a community decide to fairly award a procurement, procurement sorry, without offending or playing favorites between one family or over another family of the community? Or would you go outside to award the procurement to the unrelated Indigenous company slash business? Well, it's less common now that we directly support um, funding the goes to external researchers. Uh, now, especially for federal funding, researchers have to abide by the research ethics process of the indigenous community that you're working with. So you actually have to go through, we have a formal research ethics committee, your community should have one too. And if they don't, maybe you're the person that gets to start that. So what we tell them is, we'll support your research, but you need one of our community members with a relevant scientific background, with a relevant rigorous background to be your co-primary investigator because we no longer allow for fully external work to happen. The other part of that to mitigate for that bias is wisdom of the crowds. We have an advisory that plays a role. If you find a community member from here that's going to be a fisheries technician, that you have working on that application with you, that's gonna be your primary or co-primary investigator, they're the ones that will come to the elders. And we have representatives from all of our families, all of our communities that provide that input. So that person can't do anything on their own. It relies to what this, this unbiased group, this sufficiently diverse group, drawing from the wisdom of the crowd so that those individual small sample biases start to cancel each other out. And now we've got 25 elders from four communities representing every family that are giving their input and giving direction to that community member who's a co-primary investigator on that other project to make sure that those concerns, we know what our internal sampling issues are. We know what nepotism is. We have ways to deal with that and work around it. So that's what we do here in our community. It's probably different everywhere. And I know there are other indigenous communities with their research ethics processes. And if your community doesn't have one, you are at a disadvantage when someone from an institution shows up and says, my community has an institutional review board. That's secondary to what happens here because you don't get your federal funding until you abide by ours, here's our process. I don't care what your institution says. I have this argument with UBC, with UVic. I had this argument with my own dissertation with Gonzaga. Gonzaga University said, well, I don't know if we were gonna be able to sign off on your ethics because you don't have, and we said, your community doesn't have a leading role here. Here's a letter from the 
uh, language uh, and knowledge, the traditional knowledge and language sector saying that they have given me the data to use and they are the only appropriate authority on research ethics in our community. And I gave that back to the institutional review board. And I remember my chair was like, eh, that's, that's a warning shot. I don't know what they're, and the next day I got an email that says they acquiesce to your community as long as that letter is the first of the appendices in your dissertation that they won't comment on it at all. Your community is the only community showing that you have a process for doing it. Your community is the only community that has the right to talk about that. And, and they, they allowed it to go. Nowadays, almost all of the uh, research institutions that do work here, they will do their own research process, but they also know that, that it, you can't do your research without us. It's our data. We get to say, and we set the standard. And if you don't work by what we're doing, we'll find one of your research partners that will, well, one of your research competitors. So that is how we go about that. Try and find an unbiased group of your elders, which means you can't have small samples, get as many as you can from all the communities, have them feel empowered and playing a role in the discussion. And you should be able to mitigate for some of those. And we just don't allow external research groups to apply for funding and do research here without a community member playing a leading role. That's old school colonial thinking. And we just, people that do that, they don't pass our first step, which is the research ethics synopsis, as we call it the smell test. If you've already decided what your epistemological framework is and your methodology and your research, if you already tell us what your research questions are and you've never talked to us, you're not doing research with us, you're doing research to us. And we're no longer subjects, we're participants. So you better be willing to accept some of our research questions and one of your research questions better pick some part of our nation vision statement and work towards that. Otherwise, you're just doing research to us and that's unacceptable in 2023. Uh, next question is, are there any opportunities to hear further circles out of to Kamloops to Sequetnik? This is an incredible amount of knowledge to share and would like to look into sharing more broadly with the teams I work with on the daily basis with permission. Um, I, I will work with anyone anywhere to do just about anything as long as it empowers Indigenous community members to bring back uh, and empower and strengthen their networks, including their subject matter experts. So I'm always happy to uh, do that. I do also have some additional resources available on my Vimeo channel. If they're there, they're available to use as long as they are cited properly. Um, don't just take something and then apply it. Don't take something and then switch out all the names and say this is original research because that takes away from the academic motivation for individuals to do that kind of thing. But I'm always happy to help move people in those direction and, and advance those. We don't gain anything by having more Kutunaka subject matter experts. We're not ever going to bring the province or the federal government or the UN to its knees. But if Indigenous communities across Canada are overwhelmingly calling for better processes, systems, funding protocols, because they have educated subject matter experts in both Western and Indigenous ways that can stand toe to toe in this funding slugfest and make the argument, then we get long term structural change on at least the federal level. And that works for everyone. So I would love to see that happening everywhere, all across Canada, really all across the world, including those communities um, uh, in, in other parts of the world. And I have got to do some research and presented at conferences in New Zealand and some other places. Uh, so, so that's you know that, that's a part of what I, I believe in doing. And, and if I can support that, I will. Next question is: How can non-Indigenous folks help and be allies to Indigenous? subject matter experts in our lives in a non-Indigenous performative way, non-performative non way, sorry. Yeah, if you are in a position to go after funding, if you're in a position to write policy, then you should find some ways to support the redundancies in Indigenous communities, uh, to channel research, to scholarships, training opportunities, um, I remember one time UBC showed up here and said, well, we don't have money to just hire people to do stuff. And I was like, you, what are you talking? I showed them a chapter from one of their books where I was cited something like 47 times and I had block quotes that were longer than a page. And I was like, you're doing it wrong. What you need to do is come up with 
quarter time assistantships, quarter time fellowships. Someone working in their community needs some support, but they can't leave full time to move to that weird little five square kilometer campus that's the center of everything. Find ways to support what are going on in indigenous communities. If there are funding agencies that are asking for input, find a way to come up with some quarter time assistantships, research fellowships have a way for an indigenous community member to make sure that what's happening in the in the uh, kind of the programmatic aspect of research is also happening and you're drawing back information from that community there's someone that wants to go to school for it whether you know it or not someone out there someone's going to you just got to get them interested in and figure out who that is bring them back in just like that little boy with that horse he figured out how to ride his own horse without getting bucked off and breaking his leg or whatever it is so how do we find him how do we make sure that the opportunities to go to school are there? How do we find a way to make sure that if they already went to college and they're pretty good in one area, but they can't leave and go full-time, come up with quarter time and say, hey, one day a week, we want you to be the mover and shaker and figure out where these problems are. That helps advance research in uh, the wider scope of things. And if you can find people you can invest in and get to go into school and, and that kind of stuff, yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely do that. The, the other thing is that I tell people all the time with this presentation, the same kind of people that are like skeptical of everything that Christopher says, they're never going to listen to me, right? They don't, they don't care what I say. I'm like a bleeding heart, liberal, critical race, woke, whatever, which I'm not. I'm the opposite of all of those things, but they're not going to listen to me, but they'll probably listen to you. They'll listen to you talk about these things. And that stuff, when I talked about change happening in networks, um, Chris Uckes and Fowler wrote a really great book on the most instrumental change in networks. And it's never from the people immediately around you because you have history with them. And that filters out some of that information. The small sample bias takes over. But it's the ideas that come from more than one link away, they get filtered through and those cause significant change. They're not gonna to listen to me, but they'll probably listen to you and your social circles, uh, in, in your work environment. You have the ability to propose some of these ideas with your community you're working for. Doesn't have a research ethics committee, help them start one. If they don't have someone in a particular area, find a way to move someone into that position. If they're having trouble getting those kinds of things uh, happen, find a way to make those kinds of things happen. Um, thank you, Christopher. Um, thank you to our, we, that was our last question. And um, thank you to our panelists and to everyone for joining us today. And thank you so much, Christopher, for the amazing discussion. It was great to learn about um, empowering Indigenous subject matters, experts, um, and all the, the great resources that you've provided with that. And just before we end the webinar, we'd like to bring your attention to our upcoming UBC Learning Circle. Um, Indigenous Health and Climate Change, Passing on Solutions with Deborah McGregor. That's on December 13th at 10 a.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time. And um, you can sign up for our newsletter on our, um, in the link, sorry. You can sign up for our newsletter. The link will be in the chat. All the webinars are free to sign up for on our website at www.learningcircle.ubc.ca. And thank you. Uh, for everyone for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at our next Learning Circle. Lim Lim, thank you. Thanks.